by a show of hands, how many people are uh, DDEV primarily? How many people are Lando primarily? How many people are something else? Oh, well that's good. That's a good balance. It's probably about half-half uh, Lando DDEV and then a little bit of uh, something else. So, let's get started. So what are you gonna get out of this talk and what are my primary goals? I'm gonna be showing you a little bit about here. Oh, yeah, yeah, that probably that's as far as I can get. Um, some of the DDEV commands and some of the flags that you can take advantage of. Uh, we're gonna look at uh, the overview of the hosting providers. Because hosting providers is something that DDEV is trying to improve. So if you work for one of those companies, or maybe more of those, uh, you know, it'd be fantastic to have some sponsoring to get them a little better. Like we have an Acura one, the Pantheon one, a Lagoon integration, and a couple of others. It's so similar to what other systems do with it, uh, and I will demo a little bit of that, but it requires a little more input of you as a developer, so sometimes people don't use it as much as they could. And then we're going to talk a little bit about the community and where to ask for support. So there's a couple of different places. So I'm going to start with looking at the project structure. Because some of you might be familiar with DDEV, but if you're not, I'm going to do a quick glance into what DDEV does differently and some of the other subjects that you can see in there. And I kind of put in like the YouTube link to my talk to DDEV from DDEV to Lando, just in case you want to see more of a one-to-one -one perspective into like what is the equivalent of a hook on that system? What is the equivalent of the DDEV router uh, and why not? So, how does DDEV work? Uh, DDEV is, uh, if you could think about it as combining what a virtual machine does uh, with Docker. Because if you ever use Drupal VM, Drupal VM it took a while to set up because of the way that it was architected, but it included a lot of goodies inside of it. And that's kind of what DDEV does. It doesn't necessarily, where other systems do, one Docker image per element, which means you could have three, four, five NPMs if you wanted, many databases if you wanted, but all of them running in a different Docker container. DDEV has a couple of Docker containers preset up for you, including the web server. And the DDEV web server is one Docker image that is a little larger, but it includes a lot of the stuff that you really need to get up and going, especially in Drupal, like NPM, it has yarn, it has Xdebug, it has a couple of different versions of PHP already built on top of it. So it could save you some time when it comes to getting started and working on the project. And then you have the DDEV database server, which I'm going to cover a little bit. Because when you're thinking about different systems, DDEV supports Postgres, MySQL, and there's one more, but I'm blanking out on that, MariaDB. And the database server, you only have one, but because uh, SQL and others allow you to have multiple databases, you can reutilize that one Docker image and have multiple databases inside of it. So you could have just one database server and have a multi-site site living into that data, uh, database server, which can be helpful because I heard in the past people have had issues with uh, speed and how things behave when you're having to load 20 Docker containers just to have different databases for something that is multi-site. So that's something to keep in mind. And then you have the SSH agent, and then you have the router as well. So what is the project structure? Uh, DDEV is closer to Drupal, Laravel, and other systems in that it uses a folder. I mean, I know in, in Lando you only have like one file and it's very nice and minimalist, but sometimes, if you wanted to have an example, or if you want to dig into some of this, how some of the stuff works, you kind of have to go to the docs and hope for the best, because you really didn't have much more there. Whereas DDEV has their commands folder, they have a couple of different things that you can play with. An older version used to have the global commands under the directory that you install it. The newer versions have that at, your, at the root of your uh, user. Uh, but you still have the relevant commands to you, and we're gonna go through that a little bit. Something that 
is unique to DDEV nowadays is that you have this DDEV config dash dash auto dash dash update. What does that do? Uh, as we will see in a second, that allows you to update the DDEV config for you. Because, you know, they might change something. Like, you see, you have a database that is a type MariaDB. That directive was slightly different in the past in the way that it was processed and by just using DDEV config auto and update and you could break it into chunks if you wanted you can have that updated for you into what the current standard is for that configuration you also have something like this rarely I rarely use that command but sometimes it is useful if you don't know uh, DDEV uses mutagen to make a little bit of the file transfer and some of the stuff a little faster. But because it uses mutagen, sometimes you may have an issue when you are, if you're just using it as a um, front end app to search some sort of node or, uh, or other type of application, you may have to do a mutagen reset. So just keep that in mind. It rarely happens. It maybe happened to me once or twice, maybe in the last two years. But if there is something there, sometimes just resetting the mutagen will fix that issue if you're having some file uh, read and write problems. Something that you may also want to know is that DDEV allows you to have a local config.yaml. Because you can have a config.yaml, which will be the equivalent in other systems, but you may want to have an override for a local version just in case you want to toss in some environment variables or something specific to you that you don't need to share with your team. So you could have just a general one, but you may want to have a specific one. So what perks do you get with DDEV that are kind of unique to the system? You have NPM built in, so there is no such a thing as setting additional tooling. That just comes out of the box, and you can pick a couple of different versions, but it comes with the latest when you install it. You have Xdebug out of the box, which is handy, just because I know in the past, I mean, I went from being a Drupal VM user to Lando, to uh, DDEV, and DDEV is the one that makes it the easiest to use Xdebug. So if you like using Lando, you can, but like for Xdebug, you will save yourself some time and pain by just using it inside of DDEV, and then you can switch back if you want. Uh, just, just because of the way that it is, it's already a toggle, so you only have to tell it on or off. And you don't even have to rebuild, because you only have to do a restart because it's already in the web server. I know rebuilding Lando sometimes can take a little while, and the same thing happens with other systems, so it's not Lando unique, but rebuilding, uh, yeah, can uh, be a little annoying sometimes just because you sometimes would rather just work with it with Xdebug on, but then it slows it down, why not? You have the Drush alias already built in, so you don't really have to worry about, oh, my site says, user something and URL and having to copy that string because that already comes out of the box. Unless you disable the management settings, which I'm going to talk a little bit about, um, but if you just wanted to have DDEV out of the box, the Drush alias is built in. You have database snapshots, which some people use for CI. People use them in different ways. I've used them something sometimes to update something quickly with a configuration or test a new version of Drupal if you're upgrading to 8.3 or changing something in there and then just quickly reverting back without having to import a database if it is a large database. So and, go ahead. Snapshots are new to me. Yeah. So it's not a DB dump and a DB back and forth, it's something else? It's something else. It's something that, so, that comes in with MySQL and I think a progress that is just like a diff in time of what you did to the database, like the transaction log, and then it just brings that back in. So it's not the whole database, it's a live version. <laughs> kind of like a rsync, I guess, but for the database, if that makes sense. It just syncs that little portion that you change, not the whole thing. So for large databases, it makes a lot of sense, and especially for some CI stuff. And I think Matt Blayman has uh, written some articles about that. You wanted to see how he's using it for CI and why not. Now, my favorite feature about DDEV uh, that I come across is the bash conditional logic. Because in Lando and other systems, you sometimes have build command, and the build command, you can tell it what you want it to do, but it's restricted on the syntax that you can use inside of it. But on DDEV, you can just use regular bash, which is something that everybody at some point might have played with uh, if you are a little bit of a sysadmin. So that means that all of those variables and all of that stuff is available to you. And then you have offline support. 
uh, I think uh, Lando does some of that nowadays. But in DDEP, if you um, if you were on an airplane and you decided to take a little time to code or check out a different project, you could just do the DDEP start and it will ask you to add uh, the domain to the, your host locally because it does need to have some of that access if it doesn't have internet. And then from there on, you should be inside of it. So let's do a little bit of a highlight of some of the features that have come in in 2024. Some of them, you might be aware of them. Some of them, you may not have used them. Uh, the data star skip hooks just came in on 123.3. And what does that do? That allows you to not necessarily have to wait on a pre-star or a post-star hook that you could have to like install npm or something else and um, just run it why would you want to do that uh you may want to have a scenario where you're running it in ci or i mean there's a couple of different ways that people were describing it where having the hook is inconvenient at that stage but you still want it in your local so you can still have it and still tell it oh you know but if you are in production or if you're in an upper environment don't do any of the hooks because they're handled a slightly different way also, something new that came in is uh, DDEV and other systems download Docker images into your machine. So if you work with a lot of projects, eventually there's going to be gigs of data that are just sitting in your laptop doing nada. And if you don't have a lot of space, you might start having some of those warnings in the OS where it's like, oh, you have 5% of space. And you're like, but I'm only using one or two projects. But you may have had them for a while and you may have not have cleaned some of those images so there's a new command called ddev delete images which removes all the images and then when you do a ddev start it would just bring a fresh one down and then you could save whatever 10 or 20 gigs of images depending on how long you had them and how much project switching you have done or how many times you have updated ddev launch was updated recently as well because like ddev.com i um modify that and that's an astro project and then i played with it a little bit and now demo it a little bit but did launch is nice that it lets you go to the root of some path but it used to be whatever the data router was pointing to but now it has been made so you can tell it what domain to go to and why not or, or what a specific port to go to or in some cases that you want to just open up mail pit so you just did have launch mail pit so it has more flexibility now that it used to. i didn't used to use it as much because i would do a drush uli because i wanted to log in and not necessarily just launch the home page but this makes a little more sense because you know if you're doing something with mail or some other stuff or if you have like some front-end app running in ddev then you want to go to a specific port now the ddev version constraint that is a really nice feature if you are with a large team because now you can tell ddev you know i want this update and this version and i want everybody in my team to have that at least for this project just to make sure that everybody is updated and by including that, DDEV won't let you in, uh, run, it won't execute until you update and match, match that version constraint. So that can be kind of useful. Um, the Xdebug toggle just toggles the on and off if you needed to have like one word that will do the variable. X, XH proof, I haven't used it much, but I know it can be really useful as well. And then we have the core pack enable is to support like later, the latest versions of Yarn and some of the things that are in there. Now, let's take a look a little bit at a Drupal pod. So what is Drupal pod? I know Offer Shaw came up with that a couple of years ago and it has been improving significantly. If you Google for it, you can find a GitHub repo and now you can find it in the quick star uh, thing for Drupal. Um, Basically, what it does is that it lets you run a Drupal instance in the cloud with an issue number. Now, there are some uh, things that you have to keep in mind when you're doing that, and we're going to see a little demo on how that works. Because one of the things that you have to keep in mind is that a Drupal pod is a, a Chrome and I think maybe a Firefox extension, although I only really use the Chrome one. Um, you have to have a, a, GIF, a GitHub, uh, I mean, a Drupal org issue number that is not shortened and is not the node because like 
For example, like that is a valid one if you can see it there. Just DGO. Oh, well, never mind. Well, that number right here, this is a short way of going to a Drupal.org issue, and it will throw you there. But because Drupal.org supports that, and it also has, a, I mean, it has a couple of, way of, of ways of calling the, the, the page, but this is just by the node ID, then if you went into um, DrupalPod, you would just see it blank. And I imagine some people have experienced this, and they are like, oh, well, it doesn't really work. But it does. The thing that you have to do is you have to click here where it says view and if you see the URL, if you click view, it will change the URL name to be what Drupal pod expects, which is like the project, the project uh, name, the issue and the issue number. And now if you went into it and if you install the extension, you will have more options. Some of those options include the current branch, uh, what version of Drupal you want to run it with, and uh, if you want to install profile or not. So what happens when you click on open uh, dev environment? Uh, something to keep in mind here is you're going to see Gitpod, but the first time you do this, it may ask you to uh, accept the terms from the Drupal Association. So you may have to go um, inside of it. Like for example, I already did it. So I have this GitHub authorization uh, key, so I'm gonna remove it just so you guys can see that. So the first time you're doing it, you're gonna go into an issue, make sure you are logged into Drupal.org and make sure that when you go into changes for any given PR, you are also logging in here. Because this is a GitHub as well, and there's the GitHub for the enterprise one, and there's this one. But if you're not logged in in here, you might be stuck in a loop when you get to this screen. Now let me refresh. So if you are logged into both, then it will tell you, oh, you need an access token. And that's something new, actually, that this came in this year. And what this does is that you don't have to set up SSH keys, because before, you will have to go here and set up an SSH key and add that. And then once you have that, then you could access some of that information. But that was kind of annoying and extra if you just wanted to spin up a project and contribute to something like Project Browser or why not. So now, because uh, you authorize the application for the Drupal.org association, you can just prepare the environment, do a git commit, a git push, and it will go into the right place. Uh, so fairly nice and easy for contribution or for any other thing that you might be doing. You might be working with a contributed module that needs a little patch, but maybe you don't want to have to clone that module by itself and have to set up an environment just for it to have a git diff or whatever. So this is a way, an easier way of doing it. And so this will run, this runs DDEV as well. And it runs um, a couple of tools in here that let you uh, have uh, Drupal, but also the the module and patch that you are trying to update as part of the dependencies in the tree, so you can access just Project Browser and just just Drupal itself if you want it. But like you can get commit straight to that uh, module without having to worry about Drupal itself, since that will be ignored. But Talking about that, you have another thing that is based out of DDEV that is called Drupal, uh, DDEV, Drupal Contrib. And um, they do things a slightly different Drupal bot on this one, but this is another nice one because what it does is that it lets you have a local version of Drupal for contribution where it sim links your folder, and I can show you here in my machine, uh, it sim links your folder. So you have like, in this case I have project browser. So you have project browser at the root and then you have your web folder and inside of your web folder you have Drupal inside but it's ignored. So you can do things like change stuff specific to project browser and not have to worry about having to uh, connect uh, a git subtree or some other type of thing to actually commit it. You can just make the change, uh, push it and then it will be in the right place at the right time where you need it. So I like to use it from time to time just because it makes things easier and simpler. Um, and as you can see, I mean, it also comes in bundled with 
and its own set of custom commands because some commands that you want to have that are included are like Drupal's core ESLint, the Nightwatch command, some stuff with PSP, CS, Bowser, StyleInt. Because if you're contributing for something that might be a, a contributing module or even some of the core stuff, you may want to run some of those scripts in it. Can you talk about the web folder, the commands web folder? People don't know about it. This is one of my favorites. Yeah, I actually have more slides about that because I should probably get uh, moving in there. Uh, yeah, I uh, broke down because DDEM has commands that you don't even see sometimes. Have you played with DDEM share? DDEM share, the live sharing for it with Ngrok. Uh -huh. I haven't played with it as much, but I know it can be pretty cool. If we have time, I'll be happy to talk to you. Yeah, that'd be fantastic. Um, so, let me see. Did uh, the other thing finish over here? Yes, so now we are in Drupal Pod, and you're thinking, oh, well, where is Project Browser? And that's what I wanted to work on, and maybe I wanted to change some either PHP or some Svelte code. So you will go in here and then just change whatever you need, and then compile it, and uh, it will be ready to go. And now you have a Drupal site here just pinned up and ready to go, and the password will be admin, admin, and you can do this for any of the issues that are out there where you're just doing contribution or some of your own exploration on like a DDEV module or patch. I mean, you need to have kind of like a patch for it to run. I think they're trying to make it so you don't, but like at the moment you do, I think. So yeah, so let's go back into the slides. Uh, so we saw a little demo of that. So environment variables. DDEV provides you with a lot of environment variables out of the box. And all of those are available when you do a bash script. So that means that for certain things, like if you wanted to have something like, a, oh, let me uh, have DDEV gold run from anywhere. You could just tell it where the DDEV dog root is. Because DDEV, uh, as it stands right now, he executes some of the commands. But there's different places to put in commands. And I could show a little bit of that as well. You have commands that run just inside of the database container. You, you have commands that run inside of the web container. You have commands that run inside of the host. One nice thing that of the fact that we can run commands inside of the host is that you can bundle your own DDEV commands. Like they say you want to do a DDEV uh, import database and also you want to do a DDEV import files or something like that. But you want to do your own custom thing. You can call DDEV from uh, the host commands. So you could call DDEV uh, on DDEV if that even makes sense. You can have like a DDEV custom command that just bundles some of the stuff as you need it. You just have to make it a host command so it's available and ready to go. Yeah, it's, a, it's also being used in Starshock. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so there's a custom command to it. I think uh, as soon as you start that, it's a DDEV command. Which right. Performs a series of actions and yeah. uh, I think install command is what. And, and it literally launches. You don't have to do it. Just you type that one command and it launches the, the installed Starshock for you. That is fantastic. And then, I mean, these are two examples. Like, one of the commands is just to simplify having Gulp because for this specific request, what they wanted to accomplish is to run a different version of Node inside of the Themes folder, but they didn't want to change the global one for whatever uh, given reason. So you can have something like this, which is just a bash script that wherever you run DDEV Gulp, you will run it just inside that folder, and specifically on that version that they needed, and it will go on and work. I did something similar for like the hosting thing, which is something where DDEV is trying to see if we can get hosting providers to sponsor a little more there, to just optimize and make it easier for people to just sync, just do like a DDEV, uh, sync development, and just give me the database, give me just the files. Right now, you can do just the files, just the database, it's just the environments are not like fully tuned out, so you kind of have to choose and change a uh, label if you wanted to switch from dev to stage, which, you know, it could be improved and made significantly easier. And I know for people starting, that's something that I got asked in Chicago a lot because people are like, well, I want to connect it to my Pantheon, but they want to have such a seamless integration that it will be easy and then, you know, just move to pull and push. So this is an example of updating an old DDEV file config. Uh, you can see this, uh, this file. 
Uh, the only thing that is different here is that it says 10.3, but I have made my mistake. I think I might have played with it at some point and change it. I think this was an older. I think it was like maybe 10.1 or maybe even, uh, oh, no, I mean 8.1. Maybe it was like uh, PHP 7 or something like that. But what changed here is that the MariaDB version, you don't set up uh, that this way anymore. This is an old config that was on an old site because I was playing around because our Chattanooga Drupal site is based out on their Florida one. And in Florida, they use a couple of different things, but they had DDEB on their side. And I was helping them with another thing as well. So I wanted to update this script to the latest version, which now has it under the database key, and then you have like a type, and then you have a version. And if I just did a DDEB config auto update, it would just grab the latest version and try to transfer some of the stuff. And for me, it did it completely, but like if for some case you have like some niche, unique item that maybe some of these didn't match, you can always do a git diff, but this will at least take you most of the journey if you're trying to transfer or make sure that your all config is updated and then you could also put a version constraint if you just wanted people to have this version and somebody in your team is still somehow running an old data version that can parse this because this will give you an error now but if they if they haven't updated data maybe they can still run that one um, so that was like a 2019 to like a 2024 version of data and that has the core pack enable uh, variable as a default and a couple of other things in there so what does core park enable does? Uh, it's a new um, directive, but at least for my sake, the main thing it allows you to do is to switch from 1.22 to the latest version of Yarn if you wanted to just do some stuff with Yarn 4. And it does a couple of other things. And this is a little example of the error you will get if you um, have the version constraint set up. It will just tell you it failed to start the project. And you know, that'd be a clear indication that that person should update because you know, you don't want to have people just staying behind. Now, let's look quickly at uh, some of the DDEB commands. Now, when you're going to start DDEB, these are probably the things that you're going to rely on the most the start, describe, list, restart, stop, and delete. Personally, something that I discovered while putting this up is that I didn't know that you necessarily could just have two projects to start at the same time, but you can. And that might be useful if you're doing a migration, because the way that you might do a migration on data, the most recommended way, is that if one database is not the same type as the one that you have, like if your main database is SQL and the other one is Postgres or something, you could spin up two data projects and the other one could just have the name of that and then just expose that database to this one. And then now you will have all the benefits of both without uh, some of the constraints of having to manage your own. So we talked a little bit about DDEB launch. Now, there's commands that run uh, globally on any folder, and there's commands that drop specifically on the project. And so these, these commands don't require you to have a, a given project uh, started. You can run DDEB start if you haven't installed, stop, help, and why not, and they will just execute. Some of the other ones do require the web container to be there, so you kind of have to be a little more specific, but this is something that DDEB took care for, uh, of for you to make sure that you had a nice and uh, seamless experience. And there are commands that are project specific. Like if you're running Laravel, you have Artisan enabled, so you don't have to do anything for that. You don't have to worry about having WP because it's already in there. And some of the other things that may be uh, database specific. Something I really like is from time to time, depending on whether I enable a module or something else, I like to check how much my database change because you don't want to enable something that, you know, it, it will immediately, you know, uh, corrupt some of your tables or create some concerns for you in the future when you try to update. And um, DDEB makes it really easy to do like a DDEB table plus if that's the one that you have installed. And it will open it up and it'll be ready to go. Whereas in the past, when I was using Lando and Drupal VM, I have to do a Lando info or something else and then just try to figure out which port and what variable keys they were using for the database. I mean, it's not that much extra, but this is just nice sharing on top to just be able to just go into the database and have it working for you with, with pretty much whichever database uh, uh, you have installed. So DDEB custom commands. So I was talking a little bit about the ability to bundle commands. Um, 
You can certainly do certain stuff in DDEF where you just pass arguments. So if you see NPM, you, you can see the commands that DDEF has because they are all exposed and open on your machine. Most, some of them will be in your project folder and some of them will be under the global commands in, in the root folder, in the uh, root hidden folder. But as you can see, you just, you just have some metadata, very similar to what you do in Drupal. And then to pass the arguments, you just do dollar sign add and now those arguments get passed onto the next level. But when you are writing these commands, you have all the power of bash with you. So you can do stuff like, you know, null the logs if you wanted to, or add flags, which is kind of what I did. Uh, we just get in the development environment and a couple of other things that are just neat and simple. Um, I mean, the host commands, like we we're talking about syncing dev stage and prod and some of the stuff that you could do in there or pouring or why not you can also get status codes like if you see this here you might be like oh that looks a little exotic because this is not code that you will see in most programming languages but it's a scripting code and it can do you know uh, that and much more because you can have status codes and do stuff based on the status code on the user input and then take advantage of the data variables because they are exposed to this. So you could do a certain thing just if the data variable exists, if somebody typed it in, and a couple of other things there. Now you can also do that. I used it for ddev.com to have, a, to basically do what Lando does when you have a build at the beginning of, uh, of a project to just load your NPM directory and has your, uh, have your DIM available and ready. And this is one way you can do it. You can just have a, a bash script that has a little file that tells it when NPM is done and then just you know execute it, runs it, and then have it as part of the uh, post start command so you can have everything out of the box the same way that you will do with another system. I mean, Lando does it slightly different because they load the code before the image is created in Docker, which sometimes creates a little bit of warning. DDEP creates the container early and all the stuff that it needs to do, and then it mounts the file system. So with this way, you can just tell it, oh, you know, just make sure that it's accomplished towards the end, and then just give me a, an output about it. And you could also play with the colors in the terminal. Like I changed the DDEP described to have a little purple color because I wanted to make it a little more obvious for people to see and easier for people to use and why not. Um, but you can also do stuff like this. Like, you know, I was showing you this command that uh, somebody made to just make the DDEB uh, gulp uh, a straight directive. But if you just wanted to have DDEB gulp globally, because this project never really requires gulping any other path, you could just have an npm run prefix and then just give it the path and the variable. And now you could just have like a uh, did a go command that executes this and it does the same stuff it's just slightly different and it doesn't really use like changing the node version but it's just a light saving little tig uh, trick did uh, exec I know some people you I don't know if you knew but like if you're executing something like this is the same stuff that we were looking at earlier if you wanted to execute it from a given directory you can just give it the D flag and then just have a period on it um, or you can just tell execute. Some people really like the period because it saves them some, from typing a little more. It's really up to you whether that is beneficial. But yeah, it's it's just, kind of, yeah for the, like when, whenever mm -hmm. I have, have that, that's when I write a custom command. Oh, nice. Because like, oh, I might have to do that. Right. I don't have to want to remember that. Right. Yeah, it's a long string. Team that have to remember that. You know, you want to run go, like you know, name it, like don't see. Or right. Boom. Yeah, yeah, simplifying because it's not going to change a lot in that project, and then you just make it significantly easy for everybody else to enjoy, have fun with it. So the DDEV hooks, um, well, you know, they are very similar to what other systems use. The only thing you have to keep in mind is that they execute after the web server is ready to go. So sometimes you have to do some stuff in bash like i was showing earlier if you want to like install npm and do some of the other things because they don't run even the pre-star runs after the container is kind of like up uh and why not so that's something to keep in mind and you can do a lot of clever stuff some people don't necessarily use the the hooks as much because you could just use bash and tell it to do a thing and just do the and command and have them do two operations 
the data router uses traffic, uh, and I don't know that I don't know that many people who have used this, but Randy has been doing some uh, uh, DDEV contributor training. So if you are interested in uh, modifying and tweaking the DDEV router to do kind of your own unique use case, you could look that up and you could do uh, some fancy setup with it. I know for my sake, I mostly done the web extra expo, uh, exposed ports. Uh, and I played a little bit with just modifying the Docker container to have a different path, as we were seeing a little bit. Like you could have um, a URL and a port number like 3000 or something to launch uh, your node app, or you could just give it a path. If you wanted to have like a pattern lab and instead of having to link to the port number, you can extend that in DDEV and then just have, uh, and uh, Andy Bloom actually wrote an article about that if you guys are interested in how to do a little bit of that. And um, yeah, it can be nice to just not have to worry about what number is it running on. Something like a DDEV site, uh, forward slash, hot module, reloading, or HMR, or just like the port number itself. It's a slightly different workflow. But uh, yeah, and it just requires a little bit of modification in the Docker file because DDEV lets you do a, like a extend of the Docker file at the end, and it would just grab it all together and put it. Or you can just have like your own little addition to it. And there is more to read here on the footnotes and some of the links for it. Custom images uh, in DDEV. Uh, there's some scenarios where you may want to have like another database. I know I added an example in here for that, um, and that can be useful. Um, but something to keep in mind with uh, DDEV and any other system is that remember to clean your Docker images. I know this is a command that Randy ran the other day, and he was talking to somebody because they were running out of space. And then you could do a Docker image LS, and then just remove all the Docker images that you have. Because I'm sure all of us have like some stale images, unless you delete them recently. Or you could just do DDEV delete images, which is in the recent version of DDEV. So if you update, it's a little easier to remove those. So some examples. So this is the ddev.com uh, config, and that includes the web extra expose ports, which lets me just uh, use 4321 to have hot module reloading if I want it, and then just be able to change some of the variables in there. And if you just want to have the main build file or the build side, you can just go to the root and that will be loading. And uh, this is actually uh, public because data.com is hung up inside, so you can take a look at that and inspire your application if you need to do something similar. You also may see that DDEV doesn't really have to have a database container, so you can omit it in cases where you're doing some sort of like web application that is only consuming and exposing data, and then that way save a little bit of resources. Drupal.gopcon, um, I talked to Mike Madison a little while back because I was like, that was a really, Drupal GovCon 2017, which is the site that they currently use, had a Lando file that I benefited a lot uh, in my previous job to just kind of like bring us into Lando because it was one of the very few public examples of Lando out there because like, you know, actual configuration that people are using, you don't really see that as much. And he had a couple of nice tips in there. So I talked to him about potentially making that side uh, a DDEV side or uh, having it used both DDEV and Lando for people to have examples as they are comparing them and seeing what two works best for them. Uh, so we added DDEV to it recently and I also did some updating for the Lando one, not fully. So if somebody knows uh, Lando wants to help upgrade a little more because you know there was a couple of things with the SSH keys and we know that Lando had a couple of years ago. I didn't want to go into testing all of that. So that some of that stuff is probably, it has a little bit of craft, but it works on the latest version of Lando because I tested it. So if you want to see it and compare it, that is a good example that supports both of them at the moment. And that runs one of the, you know, their, their uh, main site. And then we talked about did a Drupal Contrib and how that can be uh, an easy way for you to spin up any really project that you have, whether you're contributing to Starshot and Project Browser or any other thing. Um, it makes it easier for you not to have to worry about copying some files out into another folder just to have the Git remote be set up uh, correctly and for you. Um, environment variables. In DDEV, you can have environment variables on your config.yaml 
or you can have a dot environment where a folder that is uh, ignore and uh, just add some of the stuff in there if you have some sort of like key for like google maps or so, some other stuff that you may want to just keep in a separate directory so what is unique about data when it comes to the database that it comes bundled with one database image uh, Lando and other systems you can select whether you want MySQL, Postgres, or something else, and you could end up with 20 of them if you wanted. DDA's concept is about simplicity when it comes to that, so you get one, you can pick uh, a couple of different options, but you get one of them, and the way that you have multiple is you have a separate mini project that just talks to this one, and it's really easy to expose what the, the other project's database and some of these other settings, so you can just keep them insulated into like their own bubble. However, if for whatever reason you still needed to have like a second database server in the same project, you can just have a custom Docker file. It will require you to know a little bit of Docker, but I know in some cases that might be worthwhile if you have like a specialty niche scenario. And there's a couple of examples out there. I think I included one in here as well. Uh, on how you will do that. So the recommended way is one database type per project. You can have multiple databases because you can have multiple MySQLs, multiple Postgres inside of it. Just have one type at a time in one project. And then if you need to have a different type, just have a slightly different project and have them communicate. And if you really needed to have a second database that is a different type on the same project, then just modifying the custom Docker or finding something. Like that. And there's a couple of add-ons that we are working on like making that a little smoother if you need it, but making sure people know that that's not the data recommended way. It might be like land on some other systems, but if you do try to do that here, it might be a little harder and you might have a rougher experience at least for a little while. So this is what you need to do to just expose one uh, data uh, project to another. Uh, fairly straightforward, you just tell it what link you want and which item you're trying to access and it will let you, you could curl that other project, whatever you want to call it, and then just get some of the information from that database, and why not, because you will have some of the credentials, and a lot of the stuff is based on the project name, so it should be uh, fairly straightforward to enjoy that feature. And if you need it, I added this one, because I know Mosh Wisman, who does uh, Rush, uh, he has this example that is out there and he's talked about it from time to time with open mass where he added like a separate database because he needed per Kona server for something. Um, so that is one example out there. I mean, you do have to know a little bit of Docker, but you know, if you really needed it, it is available. And then you have, you know, some of the handy commands, database commands that you can use that I was talking about and then just being able to go into them. Now, environment generated variables. Some variables, you don't necessarily need to heed them as much as we did the environment variables because maybe they are just something standard. Like you can have, um, you know how it provides your Drush alias? If you disable the management settings, the Drush alias, you still kind of have to tell it that you want to use the Drush alias because the, the managed environment does a couple of things for you. So then you can just place it in here and this will be on your config or jaml and every other thing that you may want to have. Uh, you may want to have like some variable that you don't care being exposed because it's something related to, I don't know, some uh, system that just has to do a little handshake but it's not secure, a security concern. You can have it there or in the environment folder. And it will look a little bit like this. And also if you wanted to like change the Drupal private folder or the Drupal temp location, I thought that was kind of interesting because some people want to and then this will give you that variable available in the PHP file so you could just be like Drupal private, go to this location because I'm telling you to or the config sync, I want to have it in a different folder. And if you did disable the management settings, the only thing you have to do is this option right here, Drush options URI, be the primary URL and this will do that for you. I know some people do that if you want to have Lando and DDEV in the same project because you have to disable the management settings otherwise DDEV will create settings.ddev.php and it will take over some of the stuff that you may not want to worry about but if you have both you may want to have the settings.ddev thing and then you may want to have a settings.local where you redirect it wherever you need it. If you're running uh, DDEV, do this. If you're running Lando or something else, do the other thing. And that's that setting, disable settings uh, underscore management.
Uh, and that adds this to your default settings at PHP automatically. If you don't remove this, which I wouldn't recommend you do unless you're trying to support Lando and something else in the same project, then you get this statement that is like, oh, if the environment is DDEV, run settings.ddev, and you can always modify this uh, to run like settings.local or just move this string into settings.local and have that as the primary. And then if it is DDEV, run settings.ddev, and if it's Lando, run Lando. Which is kind of what I did with the Drupal GovCon side. So you can take that as an inspiration or an example if you needed to. But what about a BLT and ACLI and some of the other commands that you may be thinking that you like to have and how do you install them and how you add them? They already come with it. ACLI, Terminals and all that stuff is inside. It's just not exposed. So if you have any DDEV project, you can do a DDEV execute ACLI and you will see the ACLI commands in there and they are available to you. So you cool. Now use the hosting provider and do your own thing because you have ACLI available and you can provide it a token and why not? It's just, I mean, you will be doing DDEV exec to access it instead of just DDEV and pull and the specific command. So hosting providers, there is a bunch of them. Rsync is the dedicated one for like if you're doing some AWS stuff or DigitalOcean and you want to just sync some of those environments. Uh, you could take advantage of rsync and then just have some fun with it. And you know, uh, some of them need a little more sponsor, uh, sponsorship than others. I think uh, Platform and Acquia are a little better than the Pantheon and the Lagoon. And uh, just because they're a little older and a little outdated and we could probably improve them to make sure that people's experiences with it is as seamless as uh, it could be. And um, something that you can do with them um, as you set up a hosting provider is you have to go into the web environment and provide it uh, the machine token because you know it kind of needs that to know. And you could do it, I put it here for now, but you could do it in the hidden dot uh, environment uh, file if you wanted to hide it a little more. But if you put it here, it will be shared in your project with the other developers. It might be handy if your GitHub is private might not be handy if it's public, but you know, that's one of those things. And then if you were using a Pantheon, for example, the way that it will work is you can have a flag that is dash dash environment. So in Pantheon it's interesting because then when we haven't updated in a while and the way that it works is you need to add the project uh, key down here uh, in order for it to know whether it's connecting to which side. This is Drupal Camp Chattanooga 24 and what environment. So you have to know what environment you're connecting to. And the easiest way to get this variable is if you go into the dev environment for Pantheon for any given site and you click on the URL, the URL will tell you what it is. And it is case sensitive, so if you do it uppercase and sometimes it's on the title, it may not work. So that's something to keep in mind. But if you didn't want to do this, um, I don't know if I tested that, but I know if you have it here and for some reason you're just one stage, you could run this line and do that stage or that prod and it will pull it from that environment without you having to change this string. Otherwise, at the moment, you can have to change this string every time you are switching from one environment to the other. Uh, but you don't have to do much that provide a flag if you want to skip the files or if you want to skip the database. Most times, you want to skip the files if you're using something like, um, what, what's the name of the thing, file proxy or something? The one module that lets you just sync your files down on one file. Yeah, everybody knows it. Yeah, it's a cool one. It does save you a lot of time. So if you haven't heard of Stage File Proxy, go get it. Because that is uh, nice. And so for this one, I did a little bit of a layer. And I know I was talking to Randy because he was thinking about updating it at the hosting layer. This is just a custom command that I did. And I added a link to the... Uh, to my GitHub gist in case you wanted to play with it because it just makes it a little easier to see um, how you could create your own flags because this flag minus D minus D minus F and why not I was just playing with that to just like make it so I just download the dev environment with everything just the files just the database and then just have like a DDEV sync instead of a pool which is fine the pool is fine it's just like I feel like with a sync it might be like BLT sync and a couple of other tools in the past, uh, easier to just be like, oh, I got everything I needed, I'm good to go. 
So this is one of the things that we want to improve that might come in one of the later iterations of DDEV, maybe later this year, maybe early next year. But that one is looking for some sponsorship. So if you know some of those hosting providers and you can nudge them a little bit to work with DDEV about that and the DDEV Foundation, that'd be fantastic. Because, you know, it kind of goes from that into their pipeline and into potentially having more uh, sites available. Uh, DDEV add-ons. I personally don't use the add-ons as much. I think some of the core um, contributors to Drupal and a couple of other people might use them most, more if they want to have Varnish or PHP MyAdmin or some of the other stuff. Uh, there's a couple of them that are useful, like the Drupal Contrib one, which is an add-on. If you just want to see all of them, you can do the dash dash list, dash dash all, and then that will give you a list of all the add-ons available. But something you wanna, something that they asked recently, uh, this last week, Randy had a training is, people were asking, what if I wanna have a private add-on? What happens with that? Because that's not technically supported, but the way that you will do it is that the DDEV get can get a file path, so you can just make it, so if it is a private repo, you can just sync that down by doing a git clone or something and let git handle the authentication. And then you can just tell it what the file path of that is in your machine and it will install it from something that you downloaded. And um, that other one is kind of useful. If you are having a couple of add-ons and you're running DDEV on your CI and you don't want to have the add-on run on the CI because you may not need it and it just adds maybe a little blood to the CI, you can just do the remove and the remove will skip the add-on and the CI doesn't. I think there's a remove and a delete. I know that word is a little tricky because you will think it's removing the add-on itself, but it's just not loading the add-on on that environment, kind of like removing it before, but temporarily so you can still keep it uh, in the configuration because the add-on just adds a couple of files to the DDEV folder so it knows that next time you add it or next time somebody does a DDEV star, it needs to load the add-on as well. Some resources. If you haven't contributed to DDEV or you would like to know more about or you can uh, make and wrap your own tooling around it. There is a, a blog that Randy posted last year with a bunch of different video sessions and then we're trying to transfer some of those to YouTube because they were in like, a, I think it was a box or something or some other system that wasn't really good for SEO. But anyway, there's those there and there is like blog posts about it so you can learn more about the specific thing that you might be interested in learning. And there is like, the upcoming trainings are already happening and there's quite a few of them from this year that are posted and that could be useful and handy to have. Um, if you haven't used the quick start, I rarely have had an issue with the quick starts uh, when using DDEV. I know with other technologies in the past, sometimes they work, sometimes you will have some issue because something maybe wasn't updated or, or why not. But when it comes to documentation, DDEV does pretty great. So if you just wanna test a Drupal 10, a Drupal 11, or something else, go ahead and try those out. Something that I uh, mentioned before, but I know DDEV is trying to make sure that people are aware of, is make sure that when you go to the documentation, I think the SEO has cleaned it up a little more, but make sure you go to the stable website and not to the latest, because the latest is unreleased, an order release means you may not have that option or it might not fully work for you as you thought it might because you just happen to land on that. So we put this uh, yellow banner, I think uh, early this year and why not, just to make sure that people know that if they are reading this, it's fantastic, but that's an upcoming version. That's probably not what they're running on their machine. So just use this table first. Check out the DDEV store. Um, Connect with us at the Chattanooga Drupal Users Group. I think we're one of the uh, few ones nowadays that still meets and has like an in-person and an online presence. I know Lee over there leads it, so we have it from time to time and why not. I think ours is like next Thursday. This is a nice time to, if you wanna just pop in for a little bit and say hi and talk some Drupal or just talk some general stuff. Uh, the Discord community is where uh, DDEV resides. So if you are getting stuck on some issues and maybe you are doing the Drupal Slack and the DDEV channel on the Drupal Slack, that one doesn't have as much visibility. And one thing that DDEV has is that it has a larger community nowadays and it includes Craft CMS, Typo3, and a bunch of other communities that are based out of Europe and other time zones and some people from Australia. So if they don't answer uh, on the DDEV uh, 
Drupal Slack, you have a higher chance at getting your question answered in the Discord channel just because there's that much more people. Although Randy tends to be pretty good at checking all of those and stats as well, but it'd be fantastic if more people were on the Discord side because it, it makes it easier to have other people jump in and maybe save him some time. I mean, I've seen Randy spend more time on an issue, like you are facing an issue, you'll get tired, but Randy won't. He'll continue pushing you. Yeah. <laughs> Continue <laughs> hey, hey, yep, yep, yep. And most of the time, it's little thing, a little uh, error. Sometimes it's usually generated errors, but Randy does a good job at like trying to work with you at brainstorming where the issue may lay, and he may ask you to do like a DDEV debug, something to just make sure that it's not something in the configuration. Be careful with the YAML file, because you know, as uh, we all know, YAML is a little tricky with white spaces, and sometimes you might have a little typo in there, and uh, that thing won't work. But like, yeah, most of the time, that will be fairly straightforward. Any questions? I know uh, there's quite a little bit of information there. Uh, the biggest thing is try it out. For me, the biggest uh, time savings have been with Xdebug. We don't have to worry about it. it works this time, but if I upgrade, it won't work the next time. And uh, something I didn't cover is that Dedeb uh, has integration for Colima and a couple of other things besides Docker Desktop. Docker Desktop is okay, but sometimes the GUI gets stuck on you and you have to restart the GUI. I don't know if it still does it as much as it did in the past, but it was one of those things where, oh, you know, I'm, Colima has had a couple of issues here and there, and I was a little concerned because I like the GUI because I could see the images and which ones were spinning and which ones were stuck. But some of the terminal stuff sometimes uh, behaves a little easier because I guess it doesn't have to deal with some of the extra complexity that the GUI brings. So rarely I have to like debug something on the terminal, whether you're using Colima or something else to have it there. So, so for uh, uh, for Mac, is uh, Homebrew kept up to date? Yeah, Homebrew is the uh, recommended way, actually. Okay. I update with Homebrew. Uh, and I know Lando and a couple of others, because I keep in check, are trying to include that as well in a future iteration, because Homebrew just makes it so nice and easy in some cases to be like, brew update, d boom, done. So it's not a question, but I have to have for just a plug. Mm -hmm. So if you haven't used d to share, here are the use cases. And it's one of those things that just looks like magic, whatever. <laughs> so imagine you have a designer on your team who wants to see how you've implemented the design work, but they don't run DDEV. DDEV share, let's, we, so NDROC is a service. NDROC, you have to register for an account, but there's a free and a paid level. At the free level, anytime you activate NDROC, and DDEV share, that's what it does. It automatically maps the DDEV port to a public IP address owned by Enra. And on the free level, we'll just give you a random UUID.NROC.IO. And you can send that to your colleague and say, go here. So imagine you're working with another developer and they're having a bug on their machine in the Drupal interface. You can have them spin up an NROC share and go and log in as the admin on their machine and do it. That's great, but that's not the best part. How many of you have ever had to write integration to an API service or an OAuth server mm. that requires either uh, uh, DNS restriction on the request or a return route request? There's no way you can you can actually test that stuff if you're using local DNS, which is what Lando and DDEV do. Mm. And that's what NGROC does. Oh. At the paid level, you can reserve the name of your instance. Mm. So you can say, yup, palantir pantheon dot github or uh, android.io is mine. Mm. And so you can then register your API service, or in, in the case that I had to deal with, the OAuth server, yes, yeah, send your return request to palantir pantheon dot android.io, and it will just work. Because then when you run DDEV share, you can say DDEV, it's like DDEV share, and then there's a uh, subdomain, and you can specify as long as you have your, your paid account. 
and this literally takes five minutes to set up. Mm. I have something to add. Um, I know Android is there, uh, but again, the point is there is a, a paid feature. If you want to do it for free, use Cloudflare. Cloudflare Tunnels is there, which you can use it, and they have a, a generic command which will run a, a temporary, uh, um, will, will give you a public uh, address, uh, just like NGOC will do or Data Share will do. Uh, but then there is a, a Cloudflare Tunnels feature, which is you just need to have an account. It's free, but it will give you that permanent. Uh, or you can get a permanent one for free? Yeah. So no. what we need now is a, is a DDEV command. DDEV share command which works with Cloudflare. Right? Mm. And that would not be hard to do. Yeah, hopefully. We, we should tell them right now. Yeah, yeah, that sounds what fantastic. <laughs> hey, that sounds like something so we could have. That will be a very, very good feature. But yeah. that will, again, the dependency will be the fact that you need to have an account on Cloudflare. Yeah. Okay. Which is free. Yeah, anyway. that's no big deal. Yeah, which is free anyway. Right? Think, so we should do that. Don't forget to over use DDEV list because that is quite the gem because being able to know where the name of your project, all your projects is and where they are located. I don't know about you all, but like sometimes I will have so many projects and I will forget where I put it because it's like a slightly different version of that project that I was testing or playing with. And then with list, you're like, oh, I know all the paths. I can delete them all if I want to. And then that's something that Drupal VM made a little tricky because, you know, if you remove the VM, sometimes uh, some stuff will get mad at you and you'll go, oh, let me just restore the VM and I guess I'll forget that it's in that corner for the time being and other systems as well. Yeah. And one more shameless plug. Now, do 